Namaskar and a very warm welcome again to Talking Architecture, the bi-monthly series in which we look at how architecture can contribute positively to society and to culture. My name is Anisha Shekhar Mukherjee and the series is organized by the India International Center, New Delhi. This is our 10th session. And in the previous nine sessions, recordings of all of which are available on YouTube, we've um, heard about and spoken about philosophies and practices of architecture in India that lead to thoughtful and considerate built environments that are a response that are a response to where they're situated, uh, those who inhabit them, those who work in them. And in this, the 10th session, we will see how such philosophies and practices are followed in Africa and at an international level through the work of Alan Schwarz. Alan's life work, the Mezenbeet Forest Center, which he set up in 1994 in Mozambique's Mayombo biome, is a unique grassroots-based forest management system of conservation by design, where they craft usable art in the form of high quality and sustainable forest products as an antidote to what he calls the destructive neo-colonial economics that plague our forests. Alan came to this career having taught a program at MIT, CAVS, titled Design with Nature, and having nursed the concept of cradle to grave analysis in design through its infancy, based on a successful practice as an artist, craftsman, architect, and environmental designer. He frequently guest teaches on environmental and social issues and responsibilities of architects, planners, designers, and makers at many international institutions based on his rigorous practice at Mezenbeet. Alan is an elected Beautiful Soul Africa Fellow and Ashoka Fellow. He was recently acknowledged in a Penguin publication of the world's 25 leading climate warriors. Alan is joining us today from Portugal. Thank you very much, Alan, for taking out the time to be with us and welcome to Talking Architecture. We look forward to hearing you and seeing your work. And um, before I invite Alan to begin his talk, which he has entitled Back to Basics Through Usable Art. May I remind everyone who's attending the session today to please send in any questions or comments that you may have in the Q&A box with your names. And please do so as these occur to you rather than wait for the end of the session because this is a time bound session and um, technology does have its limitations. So to ensure that we don't miss seeing the questions, I'd request you to send them well in time. And we'll of course try to include as many as we can in the one hour that we have at our disposal. So with that, I'll leave uh, and hand the mic to Alan. Welcome again, Alan. And uh, may I request you to begin? Sure. Um, Anisha, thank you. And uh, um, I'm not particularly fond of doing classes uh, virtually because one doesn't really have the direct communication with people that one has if you're sitting in the same room. And uh, um, the other thing is that, you know, I'm sitting here with my glasses and a little screen and effectively talking to myself, which is kind of weird. Um, just to give a bit of background, uh, I was born in South Africa during the height of the apartheid. Um, my parents came here, my mother fleeing the Bolsheviks, uh, my father fleeing the Nazis as a, as a boy. And uh, I think it's very important to have that as a background where I have spent my life living in zones of conflict where I was not particularly happy with the world around me. Uh, I developed and worked uh, at school, used to bunk school to do an apprenticeship as a carpenter, 
Uh, I remember when I was a very young boy, my father being one of the defense lawyers at the Ravonia trial. Um, and I think those are things which really mold who one is. Uh, at the end of school, I had a number of things which I wanted to look at, most of which were trying to create some kind of synthetic or different world to the one that I was living in and which was in conflict. Uh, that really came to a peak where I was conscripted to go to the army, which all uh, young white men did, um, whereby one was actually, and in my case, training to be an officer in an army, which you actually, when you weren't in the army, you were fighting against. So it's kind of this conflict setting that I've, I've always been in and dealing with conflict and those issues are really a large portion of what has shaped who and where I am. Uh, the other thing is the idea that one of the things you do is you just create an alternative world to the one that you're living in. And um, you'll see when I show you some slides how that has molded to what I'm doing now. Um, and went through uh, quite an important change in South Africa, uh, left in the 80s to go to MIT, uh, got a job part-time teaching at CABS, uh, largely because I was capable of being Otto Pina's hands. Uh, he was getting old and I, having been a craftsman uh, and an architect, was pretty useful to him. Um, then went on to do some very fancy uh, high-profile design work for Ben Thompson, um, some stuff in my own name and in a small practice after, after that. And all of this at the same time as really trying to get to grips with what my responsibility was environmentally. And I always wanted to do things which were sustainable. Uh, I was involved at the beginning of the whole conceptualizing of cradle to grave analysis in, and using that as a tool to understand sustainability and responsibility. Um, but I found that most of that, and we're talking 35 years ago, was absolute bloody nonsense. It was all thumb suck, and I desperately wanted to do it for real. Um, and I happened to be doing some work for a fancy resort client when the Berlin Wall came down, and with it, you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the support systems of the Cold War all fell apart. Uh, one of the consequences of that was that Mozambique, um, their civil war came to an end and it was possible to go there. Uh, Mozambique is significant to me because as a boy, the wood that I used as an apprentice came from there. And it is dryland tropical forest which produces some of the most decorative and some of those high performing timber in the world. So that's really the, the, the background uh, of what it is. And we'll, we'll go through what I did. A lot of bling in the work that I did, a lot of image, uh, and not very happy with it. And almost all of it was to support lifestyles, which I consider to have been rather parasitic in terms of its relationship to the planet. Um, I found myself at, in Mozambique, as I say, just after... Uh, the Civil War ended, uh, rediscovered the timber that was there and went to look at it. I'm going to change the subject a little bit uh, and to get to the next piece. And that is, what do we do when we go on holiday? And one of the wonderful things that we do on holiday is we go to markets and we never shop at markets. We all shop online these days. But in markets, what's really nice is you have this direct relationship with the person who's selling the product. And farmers markets, you can even have direct relationship with the guy who's growing your vegetables. And those are wonderful things. And that direct relationship is something which I think is very, very important in the process of designing things. That we cut out all this middleman nonsense and we just get back to what it is. And one of the most important things we look at is we look at relationship and we look at relationship between ourselves and the people around us, between ourselves and the things that we consume 
and very importantly, between ourselves and our cosmology, what goes on around us, what our belief systems, our way we relate to the environment, uh, to our history, all of that comes into our cosmology. Now, the other thing that we do on holiday, which is when we actually become who we are, is we go to museums. And very often we'll find ourselves looking at a bunch of old pottery and discarded stuff that some other culture threw away a couple of thousand years ago, a couple of hundred years ago. And through those broken pieces of their society, of their artifacts, um, and very often in their ruined buildings, we are able to reconstruct what their culture was and what their traditions were, what their lifestyle was, and in many cases find these things quite wonderful. And we discover marvelous relationships, particularly the one between people and their cosmology and their individual relationships to that. Now, today I think of it and I look at the things that we throw away and imagine an archaeologist in a few hundred years' time digging up my garbage heap and trying to reconstruct the society that I was a part of. And to be quite honest, it's embarrassing. <laughs> it really is. It's horrible. And I think that that is something that one has to think about very clearly when we're doing stuff. And we need to look at when we design designing as if we are actually going to serve that archaeologist of the future. And I'm prejudiced because my daughter is studying archaeology, but that's besides the point. Okay, so those are some principles which are, you, we start to look at. And when we look at those things and we start to look at even what our art is, and I recently had a massive argument with a curator of a museum in South Africa about African art. And we were in this brand new award-winning museum in Cape Town. And it really is quite wonderful. It's got great paintings all over the walls. And he was saying how terrible it was that a bunch of white guys had always appropriated African art as part of their stuff. And I said, well, yeah, they did. You know, so what? You know, that art is about learning from each other. You know, it's a relationship thing. It's wonderful. You know, I don't see it as appropriation. I see it as learning from each other. And I said, but at the same time, you're not looking at the fact that all of these beautiful paintings here are European studio art, which just happens to be painted by black people. I mean, it's BS. And it's not actually derived at all from the art tradition of the place. And the art tradition of the place is actually making usable things in a present and gorgeous way, which links one to one's environment. So I think it's important to look at when we look at the pictures, which I'll show you in a minute, of the artworks that we're creating, um, that we're looking at artworks which are both usable and which reflect what their use is, just because they're effective artwork, effective objects and usable objects, but their purpose is also to communicate our relationship with each other and with our cosmos. And that's what makes them and elevates them to art. And I think that's something which is very important in the way in which I work. Now, part of that connecting to the cosmos is a search for meaning. And the search for meaning, and I've spoken about connectedness quite a lot, but there's also just basic responsibility. And in the tradition that I come from, uh, on the first page of the book of Genesis, which is the beginning of the Bible, it basically, you know, a few lines down, when humans are made, it tells us what our job is. And our job is we're placed in the garden to tend and to keep it. The modern translation says dominion, and dominion implies domination. That's a crappy translation. The thing is that we tend and we keep the garden. Our job is to look after the place. And I think that's another piece which is very influential in how I'm doing it. And then the last thing is an issue about leadership. Um, already people have asked questions, and one of the questions was about how I deal with the patriarchy. And the reality is in Mozambique, the term for boss is patrao, and it's very often confused with padrinho, which means godfather. And as the boss, and it sounds patronizing, and it is, 
But as the boss, you have responsibilities to the people who you work with. And when you establish a project, you have a responsibility. And I delineate between what is alpha male leadership, that's the traditional patriarchy, and omega male leadership. And that can be defined in the way in which you serve food. In the alpha male system, the alpha male, the, the male lion, doesn't do very much work in terms of hunting, but he eats first. And everybody else gets the leftovers, and the smallest one gets the least, because you, it's a, a function of fighting for dominance. Um, the alpha male will never know if there's enough to feed all of that family. That pride, you don't know. However, the omega male eats last. So if you look at hunting dogs, both of these animals exist in my forest, by the way. And if you look at hunting dogs or painted dogs, whatever you want to call them, um, they are an omega male society. And the, the leading male eats last. And the reason for that is he will always know that there's enough for everybody. So again, when you're designing things and working on things, um, that attitude is what dismantles the patriarchy without uh, compromising the sense of leadership. Okay, so let's get on with, uh, um, with showing you some pictures of what I've done. I'm not the world's best and most literate uh, of uh, computer operators, so please bear with me because I'm going to do this the very slow way. Okay. So that's where we start. Uh, I spoke about creating other worlds, and this was a, a, a stage set for a corporation which made knitwear. Uh, I did this, um, I think I was 20, and designed and built the set. And the whole idea was, to, was looking at the aspirations that one may have to uh, a different world and the idea of creating a different world. But at the same time, you know, this is as corporate as you can get. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, just for fun, this one is, that's one of my neighbors right now. Uh, and he's the, symbolizes the kind of clients that we used to have in that corporate world. Uh, you may or may not find that amusing, I do. Um, then we hit a massive decision point in Mozambique, uh, which was a cyclone three and a half years ago. Um, these are actually Portuguese firefighters. Uh, we provided them with the logistic support to be able to do the work in my neighborhood, and these are my neighbors. So we had a, a, a massive break point where enormous amount of stuff had to be rebuilt. And that has a very big influence because it allowed me to show how using much more humane design systems, uh, working with people just with what we've got uh, to actually get into a better position and better life. And then, uh, okay, let's just open this, it's a bit slow. Um, and so I get involved in a whole lot of projects related to, to uh, education and uh, the building here is to house an environmental education center in Gorongosa National Park and it's built entirely of materials that are sourced uh, on site or very close to site. Uh, with the exception of a little bit of hardware and yeah, so we go through that. Also linked to education. Is taking off cuts of wood uh, and my apprentices uh, make these blocks and they are both sold and given away. Um, to uh, my neighbors for school kids. What's interesting about blocks is that um, uh, 
there was a wonderful uh, survey done in the United States uh, where they interviewed all of the uh, mothers of uh, very, very successful tech uh, kids and those very successful tech uh, people, whether it was, you know, Steve Jobs' mother or Elon Musk's mother, uh, what was the commonality is all of them played with blocks as kids and all of them considered blocks uh, as uh, the most important toy that they had. That was their favorite thing to do. What was also interesting is we looked at uh, some blocks which I had sent to the United States to a friend of mine, and she teaches gifted children. And these are spoiled gifted children who all have IQs of 140 plus. And what was really remarkable is that kids between the ages of three and six, whether they are completely deprived like these guys in Mozambique or whether they are spoiled brats uh, from very fancy suburbs in the United States, made the identical things. Okay, so just an, another piece of the Environmental Education Center. Uh, the timber that you see being used here is all um, one of the uh, local mahoganies. And the water tower on the left of this was made, as we made the other bits, we kept all the pieces uh, that were offcuts in order to clad um, the water tower and keep it in the shade. Um, dining hall. Classroom. Uh, what's quite fun when you look at this classroom is the, the length of timber we could get wasn't very big. So we had to put in columns to reduce the span of the timber and basically built the sort of tree like structure, uh, which is effectively functions like an inverted truss to be able to use smaller sizes of timber to get a bigger span. The other thing which is quite interesting, if you look at it, is at the bottom. Uh, of the windows on the right hand side of the picture. Uh, those are all vents at the top left hand side of the picture. You'll see another vent. The orientation of the building is such that that actually sets up some pressure differentials, which sucks the cooler air from the one side to the building on the other uh, and gives you some ventilation. Another little piece of it uh, doing washing or should be doing washing in the rain. Uh, Okay, and I would normally, in most buildings, not show off uh, things like the solar water heaters and the photovoltaics. However, in this particular case, the idea was to show them off uh, so because it's an education center for people to do it. What you'll also see, the whole building is made of mud. So there is a little bit of wear and tear, but that's just part of the patina of what happens when you build with basic stuff. So our clients have changed now to a new bunch of clients. All right, and we start looking at really simple, basic things. This is actually restoring the roof of a workshop um, at Mezambit. Uh, this is after the cyclone. Uh, post cyclone model of a little beach cottage. Uh, made with the original material. So the, the wood is mahogany and coconut. Um, a very fancy door. 
and then the nature of the um, Oh, that's not coming up. I'll go, just go to the next one and forget it. And the nature of the buildings start to change. These are not working. Um, hang on, something's gone wrong. Yeah, okay, we got it right. Okay, and the nature of the building starts to change a lot. So I'm doing a tremendous amount of community build earthwork stuff. And uh, this one is a particular favorite um, uh, where we actually have a, everybody involved. Uh, get involved in a, a big dance, which is actually compacting the the soil for the floor. And a lot of the buildings, because of the nature of where they are, very, very difficult uh, to photograph. But when you when you look closely at them, uh, with some quite nice detailing. Okay, I hope these are being seen. And very, very simple structures. Uh, it's a water tower. This is quite interesting, this one. This is a, a very long building. It's um, 200 meters in length, uh, six and a half meters in width. And uh, it's got a number of functions that run all the way down. And it is St. Anthony's Coconut School, uh, which is um, on a coconut plantation that we are in the process of revitalizing. And it's entirely built out of the moribund coconuts, uh, which are no longer producing and being replaced. As they get cut down, they get turned into timber. And you'll see there's a sawmill sitting there, and that sawmill is actually producing the timber for the construction that is going on around it. Mm, beautiful. And uh, that's some of the buildings that are there. You can see we have a a couple of little photovoltaics on the roof for night time and for charging cell phones and computers. Uh, you'll also see uh, a little solar cooker sitting there. So it's something which is really, it's in the middle of nowhere. So, you know, you want the energy, you've got to generate it yourself. Um, it's a fun place. Uh, what is also interesting here, uh, this is one of the workshops within it, is we've generated and developed a whole lot of products which can be made with coconut timber. Um, and if you look at it, that is one of the very first women apprentices. And that's kind of a significant thing in an excessively sexist place like Mozambique. Um, we also do some pretty functional stuff. So that's a storeroom, egg boxes, the egg boxes actually make up the structure of the wall and roof is shoved on top of it. Incredibly simple and direct. The relationships of structure to use are about as direct and as basic as you can get. Um, that's the coconut school while under construction. You see this massive long building. Uh, number one, it is incredibly hot. If you look at the shadows there on the floor, uh, those later get planted with um, granadillas. Obviously, this is during construction. The granadillas haven't grown. Granadillas, what? Passion fruit, maracuja. I'm not sure what languages you will speak. Um, so that that actually becomes a very soft shade 
on the inside and you never actually have to work in the sun. The other thing is when it rains, you can get from one end of the project always through a sheltered space. And then um, some of the coconut wood now in use. Uh, this is a journalist visiting. <coughs> a very simple cabin. Uh, this is actually the little house of a kid who we adopted, um, who was abandoned and he wanted a house. So we basically said, well, here the guys build a house. And then sometimes we cooperate with other architects. This is a kitchen I built for Francis Carey. Um, and uh, it's quite fun because he couldn't actually ever find, give me a drawing of what I had to build. So I built a number of units which are freestanding and you just assemble them and turn them into a kitchen and do the little bit of plumbing that was needed. Uh, the table in the foreground, the chairs, that's ours as well. Um, okay, so that gives you some idea of the, uh, the architecture. What's also really critical for me is putting back what we take. So uh, this is one of the nurseries. Again, very direct, simple construction. There's no uh, excess and fancy nonsense going on here. Uh, it's built out of local materials. It's literally sticks and reeds. And the other thing you'll notice is that there are benches there because if you work in a nursery and you're bending down and these plants are all on the floor, you're really going to have a sore back at the end of the day. So we grow stuff. We don't only grow trees, we grow vegetables um, and, we, and we farm. So we, we, we make things actually happen. Um, those trees which you saw earlier in the nursery, in this case, uh, planted out. and in some cases planted in support of agroforestry, which is what we eat. And you can see all of this very mixed, confused lot of stuff and messy is diverse and resilient and substantially more productive than not messy. And much better than the monocrops. And you can see all sorts of diverse things going on. Um, and collecting And making things. What's also really interesting, you'll see the pots here, they're traditional cooking pots, uh, which have been made with a purpose of we're putting holes in them so that they can work. Uh, yeah, a little bit of hype, all of us need some of that sometimes. And the nurserymen, uh, I use the term nurserymen, whether they are men or women, on the basis in a sexist society, if you apply the masculine to a job that a woman is doing, it elevates her status and she is treated on an equal basis. When those things get really big, so you can see the growth of, uh, of what's going on, other kinds of products, uh, I hope all of these pictures have been seen. Uh, yes, yes, Alan, we can see them. Some of them are <laughs> small, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, also, another issue when we were speaking about directness is processing on site. This is a, a nice still, uh, which makes essential oils. And when we're naughty, a little bit of booze. 
Okay. Uh, then we've expanded what we're doing, not only feeding ourselves, but actually we have a number of schools where we've set up uh, gardens. And this is a, the guys in a primary school who have a gardening club. And it extends also um, to university uh, where we are um, teaching medical students about nutrition using uh, traditional and better foods than feeding people rubbish like cassava. Okay, so we're now gonna look at some of the goodies we make, and that's quite fun. So wood starts um, with big stuff. And one of the things that I do is I'm loath to throw away a big piece of wood if it's cracked, so it may be um, repaired decoratively. Okay. And then you get little things. These are offcuts of black wood turned into Christmas decorations. So this time of the year, that's uh, something of some importance. A big mahogany platter. Uh, to give an idea of that, that's about 60 centimeters in diameter and is used as a server. Branch wood and small waste bits of wood turned into mortars and pestles. You'll see the effectively two different styles. The tall one being used for smushing garlic and wet things and which splash about. And the lower, wider one for grinding up spices. So it's two different traditions in a kitchen. Uh, Okay, and then we start with the cool furniture. And a big coconut wood or coconut root vase is to be used as a planter or to store your children, I suppose. Um, Tiny little offcuts becoming the uh, an abacus. Um, other forest products, those are palm adapted forest products. So that is soap, fancy expensive furniture. Games, another tabletop, some turned wood from little ones to very big ones, uh, yeah, and then some of the detail of repairing things which are otherwise thrown away. And that's something which is very thematic in the way in which I design as you throw away nothing. Uh, table and chairs for a restaurant, very classic 90 by 90 centimeter table, corner legs, really functional if you're running a, a commercial restaurant, comfortable chairs, um, another very comfortable chair. Garden furniture, uh, again with one of the, oops, we've got this wrong. Um, that's one of the women, she's an, a, a senior apprentice. Uh, what's actually quite fun is she assisted in making that and it's the first time in her life that she's actually seen, a pool, seen and sat on a pool lounger. Another piece of waste, which is quite fun, is the, uh, let's push this to the side, you can see it. Um, we won a design award and the design award was to actually uh, make design and make the awards for uh, IFRA, which is the um, International Union for Forest Research. And it's got nine little pieces 
And it sort of vaguely resembles an Oscar, but each piece is a very abstracted profile of a part of a tree or a person. And those are loose, so you can rearrange them. So everybody uh, will always get a unique award to them. A little box with two vegetable ivory necklaces. Vegetable ivory, and again, a little traditional box. You will find, funny enough, in the whole Indo-Pacific Basin, this type of carving. And uh, that type of carving is derived from um, the Polynesians uh, who took it all around the world when their empire collapsed and they just disappeared all over the Indo-Pacific Basin and took their artwork with them. Okay, another one of the women apprentices, which uh, the one in the picture is since qualified. Very big table. Again, that very iconic mending and using of things. The other thing, these are all knocked down. And the other thing you'll notice is that we do not glue and close the joints in the table, but those joints are left in order to be able to move because if you're going to export that, it's actually pretty useful uh, to have it able to expand and contract. Uh, a food container uh, based on a very traditional one, but modernized. And the beauty of wooden food containers is that they are insulated and keep everything warm. Okay, you can see the architecture in the background. You don't make money from the buildings themselves. You don't advance things. You make with the hands and of the people. So that's what really counts. Uh, the buildings just to do what they have to do. Okay, uh, well, it's not pitched up the right way, but this again is this whole process of inlaying and decoratively repairing things which are, are pretty special. And the guy to do that is quite a long apprenticeship to get to the stage of being able to do it. Smaller pieces turned into high craft goods, more tables, um, turn things. And you can see from these that one really designs very, very simply. And one of the things, if you look at it, vegetable ivory, is that you are making things which are going to have to last for at least the length of time that it takes to grow the tree that made it back. Yeah, so if you look at it, this is very traditional carving as part of uh, a wedding, traditional wedding chest. Um, and it's got some shelves in it, which have got very nice aromatic timber, which is a repellent, repellent to insects. So you can store things there pretty well. Um, if you look at that, the wood that this is made of, Songololo, which is Swazi Madagascarensis, that takes about 300 years to get to the scale and the size that you can get decent quality timber out of it. So if you're making something there, you can't design something gimmicky. It's got to be something that you're going to be happy to use in 300 years time. It's going to have to last that long because that's when you're going to get the next tree. From the very big um, table that you saw at the beginning to using all the little offcuts for individually made beads. A ring, kitchen cutting boards, single piece. They really are the Rolls Royce of cutting boards. Again, my point of it's the hands, which is what you're investing in. And that's designed, everything is designed to be worked with that. That's a sort of fun abstract picture of the construction blocks. And more hands. And looking at more complex products whereby you're not only doing uh, the raw material in a place, but you're actually refining it. So that's making soap. So one of the things that we have is we don't actually sell any raw material. Uh, it's a business which works with wood and forest products 
in order to incentivize looking after the forest and um, all of those things that are are made um, it's to sell a finished product it's not to uh, just make a quick buck you can see some of the process of that and process I say is and the ritual of making is very very important in the design and when you look at the cradle to grave analysis of it that becomes even more valuable and the mark of the craftsman that you see in it uh, and his hand is always evident which also adds quite a lot to the meaning of what you're doing that's me actually doing some work for change Uh, this is a range which we've designed for import into Europe. And the idea is that it is the antidote to IKEA. Uh, we are able with lesser known species to supply in Europe at the same price as IKEA, solid hardwoods, much higher performing, obviously substantially more durable. Uh, the design is a matter of taste, uh, but it's at the same price as what IKEA is able to do, something that's real. Recovered hardwood, and then just a reminder of the, the architecture and the things that go into it. Um, I think I've probably gone much over the time. So, uh, Anisha, we should probably look at some questions. Yes. Uh, and then maybe two seconds at the end to do a, a um, to do a summary. Yeah. Sure. Yes, thanks. Uh, how do I get out of this? Okay. Yes, I think you just close that. Oh. And we should be okay. Yeah, and if we could stop screen sharing, then we'll have you yeah. back. Good. On... Yeah. Okay, we're back. Okay. Yeah. yeah, good. Thank you so much, Alan. That was, you know, thank you for taking us through a very remarkable journey that you've made both personally and professionally. And um, for the very remarkable work that you're doing. And I'm reminded of something that Professor Narinda Dengle and Professor Sabichati said in the very first session that we had when we began the series in May 2021, when they said that architecture is not about buildings alone. And um, they also spoke about the need for architects to be catalysts and enablers to uh, counteract the effects of uh, the dominant way in which we build today, which is responsible for a lot of destruction in the planet. So much so that they actually said that architects are being trained as agents of destruction, which might be a rather extreme way of putting it. But it is true that in the mainstream way of doing things we moved so far away from you know the ideals of shelter and happiness and secure security and grounded uh, being grounded in the environment so uh, thank you for showing uh, how that can be done uh, with such uh, finesse and frugality and we have a number of questions and I'd like to take them before I come back to something that you mentioned about uh, you know cosmology and cosmogony and the worldview which is actually something that we have here as well, or we had in the Indian tradition. So um, there are um, there are some very complimentary uh, responses where people have um, Oliver Hammer Link and uh, Carolina uh, Marconi have written about. Uh, they've appreciated what you've done, and uh, uh, you know said that this reminds them of it's it's like a revisiting of the arts and crafts movement, but in in a more uh, in an improved way. Uh, Snehangshu has um, some questions to ask about uh, related to <laughs> what you're doing and how you look at it. So he's, Snehangshu Mukherjee is asking, how would you define what you're doing today with architecture, product design, education, agriculture, and altogether as an equation uh, that is very different from what most uh, architects are doing. Uh, so that's, that's, one question and related to that is uh, the economy that you've established, how does it link 
to the local community and to the larger economy of the world. Uh, so if you could um, talk about that and, um, the, and then, you know, also related to that, there's a direct question by Simon. Uh, how do you sell the work? You mean? <laughs> so, so, so let's deal with those first and then we'll come back. Okay, to well, let's, 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 do the, let's do the economic one. Um, okay. the, the first thing which is really important economically is that uh, I live and work in probably one of the poorest places in the world. And mm -hmm. it has an economy which is, has remained, even though it has 46 years, 48 years, I forget. Um, oh, it's 48 years, sorry, of independence. It remains in a neo-colonial economy. And in fact, even worse uh, in terms of that neo-colonial economy than the colonials were. And that is that it is entirely resource-based. So whatever it is that is there that is of value, if it is minerals or if it is agricultural product or if it is high-value timber, it's harvested. The only investment is in infrastructure to take the stuff out. And it is sent to a manufacturing country, usually China. Now, if we look at that, um, the amount of money which goes into the community and I did a study for the World Bank, it must be 10, 12 years ago, where we compared the amount of money that is earned at Mezambit with the way in which the resource-based economy works. And at that stage, per cubic meter of timber exported, and that was exported in logs, uh, which incidentally was illegal, but nobody paid attention to that, uh, members of the community received $17 in their hands. That's how much went into the hands of people who actually lived in the forest. Um, it should have been slightly more because 20% of the tax uh, on it should have been returned to the forest and to those communities, which never happened. At Mezambit, the same cubic meter of timber puts just over $2,000 into the hands of people. Mm. Because a lumberjack earns the same if you're working for me or for some uh, political kleptocrat selling to China. But that is only one of the jobs. Hmm. And, you know, when you're doing high quality craft, then you earn massively more. Mm -hmm. And then you have all the support things that go into that, which make ma massively more stuff. So that's the first piece of the economy, which changes. The other piece is that you create a circular economy within your community. So if, for example, somebody earns by making a, a wooden bowl, $1, and he earns a lot more, but let's just take the theoretical thing of $1. And he takes that dollar and he buys um, bread, which is from flour, which is ex imported. That dollar leaves the community. If, however, he buys his staple in the form of maize, which is ground within the community, a second person has the dollar. And the guy who ground the maize has spent his dollar on the guy who makes the cooking oil. And the guy who makes the cooking oil spends his money um, on the guy who grows beans. And the guy who grows beans spends his money on home-brewed booze. And the guy who, spend, who does the booze spends it on a local hooker, who spends it on buying food for her kids, and blah, blah, blah. All of that goes around. And very quickly, that dollar can go through at least a dozen hands. So the $1 that's entering the community actually becomes $12 of economic activity. And that really is why you look at different economic systems. You want to keep that circle within the group working to develop that group. Mm. Now, that's a very valuable concept. Part of that concept is you actually also have to make things. When you're making fancy wooden product, that can be consumed by the people who you're employing to make them. Mm. You can't disrespect people and say, you're slave labor. You know, you're child slave labor in Pakistan or Bangladesh making clothes, but you can't have these clothes. You've got to have the handoffs, which are donated, um, you know, by some Euro European country, 
to clothe the poor kids who are sitting in Bangladesh. I mean, it, it's, it's unfair and it's also economically unsound. Yeah. So you have to treat everybody not only as the um, unit of labor, but actually as a human who's going to consume all this stuff. Then you have the next issue is the cost of a value chain. And I see in the typed questions, there was somebody said, how do we manage to sell against IKEA with a very high value product um, yeah. <clears throat> when IKEA has all these advantages of industrialization? Well, tell you, it's very simple. Our value chain is intelligent. We cut the trees down in the forest. Okay. We turn them into... Uh, fancy furniture in the forest and we only transport the product that is going to be consumed now if you take the ikea chain it goes in logs to china it's sawn in tenjin but it's processed in fujian okay now if you just take from log to sawn timber if you're dealing with the wood that we have in mozambique you have a yield of 20% so you're actually transporting 80% of your product to throw it away. Now, that's a massive cost center. Now, bear in mind, when you take a plank and turn it into furniture, you know, the best furniture makers are wasting 50%. So it's, again, half of what you're transporting, you're throwing away. You know, and so... By the time you actually get to the end of it, it's only 5% of what you've actually cut down that is going to end up in the hands of your consumer. And you've transported that two or three times around the planet. Now, if we only transport what we're going to consume, we've reduced the transport footprint of that by 80 to 90% easily, if not more. And that has a massive cost. Now, Adding all of these things together, you then look at not only the cost of that, but you put every step as a markup. In the household goods business, if it leaves a factory in China, or for that matter in India, it leaves at $1. It goes to, let's assume that we send a competing with IKEA. It goes to a consolidator who doubles the price. So it's now $2. He hasn't added any value, he's just had an added cost. The consolidator then exports it to an importer and who doubles it, it's now $4. And the retailer, IKEA, marks it up by 150%, it's $10. Now, if I'm paying my guy in Mozambique and I'm being reasonable, I can pay and have a cost structure which is at $4, not at $1. So the guy in the bush is earning substantially more, okay? And then I export it to myself in Europe, that's why I'm in Portugal, um, and distribute it to the same places basically that IKEA is buying, is selling to those same people. And we mark it up the same, okay? We've cut out this whole monster of middlemen Yes. And what you've saved, you're giving back to the community. And it goes back to the community. In other words, you can actually change. And that's why I'm so critical of this neo-colonial colonial model, is that you change from a minimum income from the guy at the base of the value chain because he's actually participating further up the chain. Yes. And if he's the one who's participating, he gets a benefit. You know, you're not doing anything that's revolutionary. You're just doing normal capitalism. The guy who does the work must be paid for it. The guy who adds the value must be paid for it. But you must make sure that the guy who does the work participates fully in the system so that he can be paid fully and get real value. Yes, get the real value for his work. Yeah, and it's, fact, a, and it's, somebody, it's just a, a fair deal. Yeah, uh, somebody uh, has had asked a question, Clara Cruz Almeida, asking if there was any outside funding that Mezambique receives, and uh, especially after the cyclone. So that's... <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, outside funding, my savings. Um, <laughs> we, did do a crowd, we did do a crowdfunder, we raised $10,000. Um, mm -hmm. I won't say how much it cost us to 
to rebuild, but um, it was a hell of a lot more than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It took us a year. And okay. it's a year of just sweat and work of everybody involved. Um, what's also interesting, we managed just by doing the sale of local product uh, mm. for local consumption. Yes. Um, during that first year, we produced, you know, after the cycle, we produced almost nothing. The problem is we were hit with COVID immediately after. Mm. But during COVID, we actually made enough money by selling basic foods, cooking oil, soap, mm. uh, you know, really simple stuff which we which we value add ourselves which displaces things which are imported to our neighbors um fact, i think locally and that actually kept us kept us going through covid yes that's that's the key really if if you cater to the local economy uh you know that that's that will keep you going whatever may happen and in fact we've learned that to our cost in india where a lot of exports suddenly uh, you know, suddenly dry up like the Saharanpur wood carvers, for instance, and then they're they're thrown out of jobs and you know they're they're in desperate situations. So a local economy hinged to a larger economy is is what is I suppose what makes the most sense. And well, Ninata, yeah, yeah, sorry, you were um, you were going to say something. Well, to an example of that with us is that uh, before the cyclone, we were making soap. And our soap went to a very fancy spoiled people's market. Mm. Now, because of COVID, uh, we couldn't access those markets. Mm. And a bar of soap that we were selling at $4 mm. uh, to the spoiled market, we actually were able to sell at 50 cents within the local market. We're talking US cents, just to give you a perspective of it, in, but in local currency. At 50 cents to the local market. But they were b previously buying imported soap, which sold at 80 cents. So we undercut the imported one. And mm. you think that you that it's, you know, okay, so you make that. You'd only make a couple of cents from a bar of soap. But, you know, there are 30 million Mozambicans. Yes. You know, and a bar of soap lasts a family uh, two weeks. Mm. So you're looking effectively at a, at a, you know, and let's assume the family is 10 people. You're looking at 6 million bars of soap a month. Yes. As a market. I mean, that's an insane amount of money. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we're almost at the end of our session. We're actually at the end of our session, Alan. But perhaps we'll just take <clears throat> a couple of questions, uh, again, related to what you said. So <clears throat> Ninar Dave is very appreciative of what you've shown. And um, he's also asking, um, <clears throat> how do you uh, how do you convince how do you manage to convince people to uh, buy handcrafted rather than uh, you know industry made products uh, <laughs> of course uh, for people like us they you know they're just so much more beautiful but i'm sure a lot of people perhaps go for big brands or are conditioned to um, you know not necessarily to buy handcraft so do you have you faced any hurdles like that or um you know, I've, I've been very arrogant with my marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, when we first took the wooden jewelry to the ethical fashion show in Paris and we participated in Paris Fashion Week, um, when I arrived, one of the things I discovered, Europeans are stingy as all hell. Mm -hmm. So I walked around with a bag of wooden bracelets, very simple, nicely designed. They look like they come out of the Bauhaus. Mm -hmm. um, and... Every single woman who I met there during the setup, I gave them a bracelet. Now, they're not used to being given things. And mm. besides the bracelets, they're oh, lovely. You know, they're handcrafted, they're beautiful stuff. Um, and when the exhibition opened, all these people were wearing the bracelets. And it didn't matter whether it was the women who swept the floors or cleaned the toilets or whether it was the receptionist at the entrance to the to the to this whole fashion event, everybody was wearing them, or every woman was wearing them. Mm -hmm. And um, the I, I had a guy from one of the very big department stores, the two big department stores in Paris, uh, asked me and says, oh my God, this is definitely the, the thing. This is what's in vogue now. You know, these are fantastic. Everybody's got them because their perspective was you know, they must have bought them. Um, and as a result of that, they, 
you know, introduced us to the fancy magazines and said, this is what's happening. You've got to show it. You've got to do it. We've got on the cover of Marie Claire and on uh, Paris Vogue and of German L with these things. And it was just manipulating a little bit of how people behave. Mm. Uh, at the same fashion show, I had another director of one of the big fashion houses arrive. And he looked at me and said, huh, you know, we can buy Chinese made stuff that the Senegalese guys sell on the side of the road. Um, and I said to one of the people with me, quickly go outside, buy one of these things. And I just put it in front of him. And I said, look, do me a favor. If you can't tell the fucking difference, piss off. <laughs> and that's what it is, you know. Yeah. Produce something that is beautiful. There are enough people in the world who actually want beautiful stuff. You don't have to hard market it. Your branding is incredibly basic. You know, I've developed a name in the market over time of either my name or Mesembeet Forest Center where people know this is stuff that is responsibly produced. You know, we're the, the biggest grower of indigenous species in Mozambique and one of the biggest in the whole Miombo bio. Um, these are incredibly high value species, all of which are, are in danger. Some are threatened. Um, you know, they, it, it's known that, that we're that. And we don't have to, you know, buy adverts and all this fancy stuff. It happens. The work speaks for itself. But thank you so much, Alan, for, for showing us, uh, uh, you know, how I'm sure a lot of us have uh, a great deal to introspect about and be inspired by from what you've shown us. And um, as I said, this this is actually part of the Indian tradition where uh, you know, it's, it's our inheritance where this frugality and renewal and this sense of connection with everything is actually part of the philosophy, the worldview. But unfortunately, it's not a part of how we work today anymore and um uh, so this it's it's and, and this is something that i discovered when i was doing the research for my book on identifying attributes of indian design but what you've demonstrated to us is how to incorporate such a philosophy and a worldview into work that is uh, beautiful to behold that is commercially a success and that's also mindful and it heals the earth and the community. There are some more questions. What I have done is I've taken screenshots and I'll send them on to you. So perhaps you can dialogue with uh, you know, the people who've asked those questions, but we are actually beyond our time. And uh, with much regret, we'll have to end the discussion for today though we would have liked to have um, you know, had, had more questions and had you answer them, but uh, we, we can't, we are, we are sort of beyond our time. So, um, but I, I do hope that there is, what you're doing is, um, is also affecting uh, other people around you. So in Mozambique, of course, uh, perhaps there are other initiatives in your wake, and I'm sure there'll be other initiatives perhaps um, uh, on behalf of all the people who are watching at whatever level. So I, I do hope so. And um, thank you again. And would you like to have some famous last words before. <laughs> yeah, well, I think one of the things which to me is very interesting is the next change in my life. Um, Mezambit is now a mature project. Uh, one of the beauties of COVID is that it taught me that, or it showed me that I had actually taught people well enough to become redundant. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So the next step is actually setting up and helping other people do the same. Mm. So we have a nascent project uh, in Ghana. We have an ASEAN project in um, Zambia, and we was in negotiating with another one in Ethiopia. So, yeah, basically the same principles of just, you know, if, if you look at it in Yiddish, which is, you know, sort of tribal language, just be a midge, you know. Just be a? Yeah, a midge. I see. Means a human. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just be a decent <laughs> human, that's all, you know. I'll have a taste. So, so let's, pray, let's pray for everybody to be decent humans. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, thank you. Thank you so much again, Alan. And we'll um, hope to continue some other time again. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you.